Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Penny, and I have the honor of serving as the Chief Learning Officer here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. And on behalf of our entire team, welcome to tonight's event. Before we start our talk, it is tradition here at President Reagan's library that we take a moment to honor all those who serve or have served our country. So I hope you'll please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Please be seated. So before I introduce our special guest tonight, I want to take a moment to recognize two groups of people in the audience who, given the subject of the book that we are discussing, uh, deserve, I think, some special recognition. So first, can I ask any active duty or veterans of our armed forces to stand and be recognized? So thank each and every one of you for your service to our country. Uh, next, tonight we'll be discussing the fate of the USS Indianapolis, one of the most remarkable and harrowing tales I've ever read. And I understand that perhaps a few of our audience members are either related directly to the survivors or some of those who perished on the Indianapolis. So if you have a connection to the Indianapolis, if you could stand and we could recognize you as well. Well, thank you all so much for, for being here tonight. So my introduction is going to be brief in part because I want to spend as much time as possible discussing this compelling book as you saw in the, the trailer there. So first just a little bit of context. On July 30th, 1945, in the waning days of World War II in the Pacific, the USS Indianapolis, a ship that had once embarked President Franklin Roosevelt and also served as the flagship for the Fifth Fleet, was attacked and sunk by a Japanese submarine. The story of the ship itself, the role it played in bringing the war to a conclusion, and the fate of the brave and valiant men who were aboard that fateful night is the subject of Lynn Vincent and Sarah Vladek's triumphant book, Indianapolis, the true story of the worst sea disaster in US naval history in the 50-year fight to exonerate an innocent man. In August of 1985, in a radio address commemorating the 40, 40th anniversary of the end of World War II in the Pacific, President Reagan said, quote, those brave Americans who fought in the Pacific four decades ago were fighting for a better world. They believed in America and often they gave the last full measure of devotion. I think if those brave men were with us today, they'd be proud of what has been accomplished, end quote. And I believe that that is also true for this book, which does much to honor the sacrifice and ordeal of the men who served on the Indianapolis. When we as Americans collectively remember World War II, we often think of events like Pearl Harbor, D-Day, Iwo Jima, the Battle of the Bulge, and with good reason. Well, the story of the USS Indianapolis is sometimes forgotten, except for perhaps a memorable monologue from the movie Jaws. Uh, and it does deserve to take its place among those moments. It is one of the most harrowing stories of the war, and we owe it to those who survived and to those who perished to ensure it is not forgotten. In his farewell address, President Reagan cited the need for an informed patriotism and asked, are we doing a good enough job teaching our children what America is and what she represents in the long history of the world? Well, I know that our speakers tonight are doing a good enough job through their work on this book. Lynn Vincent is a number one New York Times bestselling author with more than 16 million copies of her 11 books in print. You are probably familiar with Same Kind of Different as Me and Heaven is for Real, which spent 200 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and was turned into a major motion picture and sold more than 12 million copies. In addition to that, she's also a veteran who served in the US Navy during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Sarah Vladek is an acclaimed documentary filmmaker and one of the world's leading experts on the USS Indianapolis having interviewed more than 100 of the ship's survivors and also released an award-winning documentary in 2016 called USS Indianapolis, The Legacy. 
So please join me in welcoming Lynn Vincent and Sarah Vladek to the stage. behind the scenes for the audience. Yes. Uh, well, I for one am, am really, really excited and, and uh, honored that you came here to, to share this story here with us at the, at the library tonight. I gotta tell you that I read this book and I was telling you backstage that it is probably one of the best books I've read in the last 10 years, uh, bar none. I mean, it was just compelling. I was telling you, I, I had an hour long conversation with my five year old about this book. Uh, <laughs> it, it really is fantastic. Um, and so the first question I have for you is I really want to get at the start of this book and, and where it came from and, and, and the genesis. So in, in, as I was reading about it, I, I learned that this project and this passion started at a very young age for you, Sarah. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about where it came from. Um, my initial interest, was, it just came from a documentary where they reduced this incredible story to a single line, which was it was the ship that carried the bomb and was sunk. And I was 13, so I didn't understand that a lot, but I understood the importance of it, and I wanted to know more, but there was no more to be found. And so that kind of, I think the mystery behind it was initially what drew my attention was, okay, there has to be more, I want to know more, and this was pre-Google, and <laughs> I went to the library, and um, really just started looking, but still couldn't find more information. So I thought, oh, someone will tell this story before I'm old enough to tell it, and no one did. No one did the story justice the way it should be. So that was kind of the genesis of all of this and meeting the survivors. Um, when I graduated college, uh, I went to Pepperdine just over the hill and I thought, oh, I'll reach out to the survivors and Ask Jeeves existed then. So I asked Jeeves um, and they connected me to the survivors of the Indianapolis and I went to my first reunion in 2001. And I mean, I got to meet my heroes and talk to them and hear their stories. And a couple years later, they said, will you be our storyteller? And I mean, come on, <laughs> you say yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and then so at, at what point, so you started to, to work with the uh, survivors. I read that you interviewed 108 of, of the survivors and, and started compiling it. At what point did, uh, Lynn, did you become a part of this project and this, this story? Well, there was a little bit more that Sarah did over those years from 2005 to about 2011 as she was doing all those on-camera interviews. Um, she pieced the story together and then she wrote a screenplay because she's a filmmaker, as you mentioned, by profession. And she took this screenplay, which was a multi-part series, sort of like Band of Brothers, and um, the, the, she took it to a major production company and they loved it. They said, this is the best thing we've seen since Band of Brothers, but we only do miniseries based on books. And so she said, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to write a book. <laughs> so <And> screenplays. <laughs> yeah, so, and they're very different, very different. And so through friends and family, um, she located, she reached out to me. And what she didn't know, and we, she lives in San Marcos, California. I live in uh, East County. I lived in San Diego at that time. And what she didn't know is that I had literally been praying for an iconic World War II story to write. And, and I don't mean like hoping and praying, I mean like really praying. And so uh, she reached out to me via email, then we got on the phone, but the problem was, all she wanted was advice. And so I was like, dang it, how can I manipulate her into <laughs> letting, me, well, letting, letting me help her write this book? But, you know, over the course of several conversations, we decided to team up, and then we began working on it in earnest in 2014, which was the first reunion that I went to. And, and so as you start to work on this and you're working on the screenplay and the documentary and the book, you're working on a lot of different ways to, to tell this story. What was the reaction of the survivors? Uh, we heard a little bit in the trailer about how they wanted this story to be told. And sometimes when you uh, talk about the, the veterans and the survivors from World War II, one of the things you hear is that they don't talk about it or they don't want to or they feel uncomfortable. So what, what was that it like as you started interviewing and as you started saying, hey, we got these things in the process, was there, was there excitement or what was the reaction from the survivors? 
Well, initially, it was just spending time with them. It wasn't, I didn't meet with them yet to interview them. I got to know them as men, family men, career men, and got to know their families and spending time with them. They began to trust me with their stories. And, you know, as we were going along more and more, they would see what I was trying to do. And, and hopefully, you know, the integrity we were telling the story with, so they were compelled to share. And, you know, many, many times throughout the process, we would hear, I've, ne I've never told anybody that before. I can't believe I said it. <laughs> and, um, you know, the family members said that as well. They'd never heard those stories. And I think it was just a matter of trust that was built over the years. Um, when I first showed the documentary at the Indianapolis reunion, I was scared to death because I'm showing it to the hardest critics and the ones that meant the most to me. And one of the survivors right after it leaned next to me and said, you got it right, kid. Yeah. And <laughs> I was like, whew, you know. So, um, and that, that was kind of how the whole thing went. I mean, I really communicated, and Lynn too, with the men as we told the story. So it wasn't just we wrote it, here's a finished product. It was, you know, there was a survivor by the name of John Wollston, who you get to know in the book, and he was reading it as we're writing it. We are sending him chapters and saying, is this how it was? And you know, he's the junior damage control officer, so he really knew the ship better than anyone living. And he was an ensign, and you know, he graduated from MIT. He was a smart dude, and he would, you know, he'd be tough. And he was a very smart man, and he didn't mince words. And that's bad. Fix it, you know. <laughs> so I mean, that that was a huge part of the journey was involving the survivors in the process, and that was how it was always meant to be done. Yeah, and then from, from a writing perspective, you know, when, when you think about it as a writer and, and you're, you know, one of the challenges, I think, in, in this book, and uh, everybody, if you have not yet read it, you should, you should get it, and it just happens to be on sale outside the store and upstairs <laughs> later. Uh, but if you haven't, you, you should. And, and, but one of the challenges is you're bringing a lot of different things together in this story. Mm -hmm. It's a big, big story, not just from, the, the, I'll say the cast. The cast isn't probably right the word, but you've done 108 interviews but you're also providing historical context. You're also you know, kind of telling the story of the court martial that, that happened with the captain. How, how do you balance what you're trying to do? You're trying to honor the survivors and tell their story, but there's also kind of a larger, bigger story. And how do you bring those different elements together as, as creators? I think one of the things that we really tried to do was write a serious, well-documented -docu history. I don't, we haven't really counted, but I think there's something like a thousand and notes. Um, we wanted to do a serious history that was accessible to a reader who maybe doesn't really even read history. And so we wanted to bring in those personal stories of the survivors. We wanted to bring in the stories of family members. What was it like to be that wife who was sitting at home and got that horrible telegram that said, your husband is missing in action? What was it like to be that son or that daughter? You know, your father's missing. And so, that was part of the weaving that you're talking about, part of the context. Um, as far as how we approached writing it, you just had to do it scene by scene. And sometimes index card by index card, we would sit on the, <laughs> we'd sit on the floor in my living room with this giant uh, cork board and have you know, a stack of scenes on index cards and be you know, sticking them up there. How, you know, where does this one go? Almost like a puzzle. I don't think that it would re really be possible to do a story like this without approaching it in scenes, sort of like a movie. And that's how we were able to weave all those stories together. And it definitely, I mean, it, it, it definitely reads like that. I mean, I just think of some of the scenes where the survivors are on the ocean and, and the way the narrative, it kind of like, it'll hover over a group, almost like, a, you know, if you were a camera, kind of hover, here's what's happening here, and then hop over here, and this is what's happening in another group. That How, how do you, when you deal with memory, and for many of the survivors, it's, it's, it's a memory of, you know, 40, 50, 60, you know, long, a long time ago. Um, I mean, were there conflicting accounts, and what do you do when you get to a point where, you know, there's, there's conflicting accounts? How did you resolve that in, in putting the story together? Um, in most cases, we tried to have at least two to three sources for every single thing that was, especially a momentous occasion, like, you know, if it's something incredible or otherworldly or, you know, a moment that seems out of the ordinary and such, you know, a group of sharks attacked. Well, okay, you have different 
versions of what that might look like, but the very personal accounts where Kozel Smith, a, a sailor who's in the water and he has his hand bitten by a shark and he's pulled under and he still survives. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> um, he, <laughs> he, you know, did he really get bitten by a shark? I mean, there were people who said no one were bitten by sharks, but remember these men are spread out over, by the time they're rescued, 25 miles. There's different groups. Some are in rafts, some are in swimming on flotsam. So the draft pattern, or I'm sorry, the drift patterns and everything going on spread them apart. So they have different stories. And so we really tried to say, okay, who all saw this happen? More than one person saw this happen. We also have the court of inquiry which was the testimonies taken from the survivors, was it nine days after rescue or? No, less than. No, uh, nine days. Nine days after rescue, that was the, you know, the closest to when they were experiencing this, that they gave a written testimony about what took place. So those things, even 70 years later, matched up with the accounts that we had. And we really tried to have a foundation in the information that we were telling. So, so another question, uh, you, you know, when you're a historian, you're doing historical research. I think there's a I, I took a journalism class in college, which maybe was a mistake according to my grandmother, but I enjoyed the class. Um, and I remember our journalism professor told us that there are facts and then there's the truth. <laughs> so how do you kind of go through, you know, like these are the facts of the things that happen. And I, we can talk about this later when we did, Todd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the court martial because I think that's a, that's a story where facts and truth, you know, and, and what really is uh, come into conflict sometimes. How do, you, how do you reconcile that or how did you approach that in, in the writing of the, the story? Well, as soon as you said that, the court martial was what popped into my mind because, you know, factually, yes, the captain was responsible for what happened to Indianapolis, but the truth was he wasn't responsible for what happened to Indianapolis. And so the way we approach that is we went back, you know, to a story that has been told before. You know, there are probably people in this audience who have read books about USS Indianapolis that had been, been written prior to ours. And so over time, as you know, as a historian, things become accepted as facts and, um, as we unraveled the story, we found out that some of these things that were accepted as facts weren't in fact true. Um, not only that, they also weren't facts. But um, what, we, what we tried to do was go back and, how do you put it, like, uh, to, to, to re-examine the story untainted by decades of influence and supposition. So we went back to the original sources and we, collected voluminous amounts of research. We went to the National Archives, the Library of Congress, the Na Naval War College to see what the ship herself was like. We went to Quincy Harbor near Boston and climbed up and down the decks of USS Salem, which is the last uh, World War II heavy cruiser that's afloat. Um, we went to personal people's homes and you know gathered records. Um, and what we did in reanalyzing all of that was to try to find not only what the facts are, but what is the truth, as you say. And, and so um, we were able to find, for example, um, that the message that was sent that has often been referred to as the wild hunter messages, um, there was a, uh, an anti-submarine attack that took place directly in Indiana Indianapolis's path extended. And over the years, some historians, respected historians, said, well, there probably wasn't really a submarine out there because these jumpy merchant skippers, uh, they were always seeing these phantom submarines. And some people said, well, maybe there was a submarine out there, and this was not the submarine that sank Indianapolis. This is a different submarine. Um, some people said, well, there may have been a submarine out there, but it was no big deal. So we, through the help of this archivist named Nate Patch at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, who ought to wear a big S on his chest and a cape, <laughs> found the records of this submarine chase and found out not only was there a submarine, but that the Navy attacked it 15 times before losing it, which meant that there was a, a submarine, an enemy submarine on the loose directly in Indianapolis's path. So that was the truth, even though the facts had been told a little bit differently for decades. 
And as I recall, that information was never passed on to the captain that, That's hey, correct. by the way, you're sailing into where an enemy ship might be or exactly. an enemy submarine. Um, so I want to dive into some of the, I, I think one of the things that makes this a, a really compelling story, and whenever you look at a narrative, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is, is the idea of conflict and what's, what's going on. Uh, and I, I taught, as I told you backstage, I, I was a teacher for a number of years. Um, I taught middle school language arts and history. Um, and when we talked and we looked at stories, we would often talk about these different types of conflicts that, that exist. Uh, you know, sometimes it's man versus man. Sometimes it's man versus nature. Sometimes it's man versus him or herself. Sometimes it's man versus society. Uh, and oftentimes, in, in most stories, there's one of those. In this story, there's all of them. And, and at the moment of the torpedo attack, it's, it's almost like all of a sudden these sailors are being attacked by a torpedo, man versus man. They're jumping into this ocean where the surface is filled with oil that's been dumped into the water and then very soon they're encountering sharks. So you have man versus nature. And then as a result of being out, they're losing their, their minds, right? They're the, uh, and so man versus self. What is it when, when you see a story that, that has this much coming at, at the protagonists, the, the survivors and, and the, those who ultimately ended up perishing in the sea. What is it like as a, as a writer when you're hearing these stories to kind of imagine yourself or to imagine the situation that, that these sailors were in? Wow. Uh, <laughs> there, well, the Indianapolis story, as you know, and you all know, is an incredible story. I mean, there's so many layers to it. And like you said, the conflict is in every level and throughout the story, but I think when you're facing this and choosing this and putting yourself as much as you can in its place as a writer, you know, frankly, it's hard to imagine. I mean, I think what came out of that was honestly spending time with these survivors and seeing it in their eyes and understanding those words didn't just tell you about conflict, they lived it and they're still living it every day. And that much conflict is carried on their shoulders to their last breath, I mean, many of them, but picking what stories to tell and how to tell it and to incorporate that all together. I mean, in a storyteller's perspective, it's great because you get to pick whatever you want. You know, there's so much, there's so much rich story. And that's why when you see renditions of this that people make up parts of the story, you're like, what are you doing? There's so much, you don't have, there's so much rich story and it's all true and it's so true that it's not even believable that it's true and I don't know maybe you can speak more to this too but I know that that was something when we were trying to tell this story is to somehow capture the enormity of all of it through the eyes of these men who lived it. And that's how you wind up going back to the scene-based approach uh, because you do have all of that kind of conflict coming at not only the protagonist but at the reader all at the same time, and so there's, you know, I mean, this is a horrible way to put it, but the, in, in terms of storytelling and embarrassment of riches, as they say, you know, because you do have all of those different kinds of conflict happening at once, and so the best thing that you can do as a writer is just tell it straight, because, um, you know, as Captain Bill Toady said in the book trailer, no one would believe it if you made this story up. It's, it's so much more dramatic than fiction. So as a writer, you just have to get out of the way and let the conflict speak for itself. I want to I read just a, a, a quick passage because the, the, the subtitle, The True Story of the Worst Sea Disaster in the U.S. Naval History and the 50-Year Fight to Exonerate an Innocent Man, talks about kind of two stories, one that's happening you know, in those four or five days on the, on the water and, and one that happens over the course of the next five decades. So the first passage I, I, I want to read from and ask you to, to comment on um, is from, this is a, uh, page 217, um, and it's, uh, I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, Dick Thielen, an 18-year-old from Lansing, Michigan, was battling nausea. The accumulation of oil and salt water in his gut had triggered it. Riding 10 to 12-foot swells up and down, up and down, hour after hour made it worse. He wondered how much more of this they could take. Earlier in the day, Thielen had been relieved to swim into Robert Terry, a fellow seaman. The two had joined Indy at Mare Island on the same day, less than two months earlier, and had become fast friends. Now floating at the far fringe of the Haines swimmer group, they vowed to watch each other's backs, but their vigilance couldn't stop the horrifying screams that erupted when sharks took their shipmates, or the unrelenting pain of hunger and severe dehydration 
It was hard not to lose hope. Thielen had already seen many around him give up and slip beneath the waves, but each time he was tempted to follow them, he remembered his father's face. Before Thielen left for his assignment to Indianapolis, his father grasped his hand firmly, looked him in the eye, and said, Dick, I want you to come home. Thielen promised he would. So when I read a scene like that, I'm, I'm kind of, I, and I'd love to get your perspective, you know, this is a, you're reading it, it seems like the most hopeless of all potential hopeless situations that any human could find themselves in. But in that kind of sea of hopelessness, uh, pardon the pun, you find this. What was it like, you know, to, to hear those sorts of stories and, and when you put them into words, I mean, uh, how, how do you kind of, from all this darkness, create a sense of, of hope and positivity as you're telling the story? You want me to do it? <laughs> <laughs> you interviewed Dick, yeah. Well, so, Personally, for me, I can still picture Dick telling me that story. And when he tells it, he grabs your hand, he looks you in the eye, and he says, my dad said, come home. Okay. And when, you know, you're doing interviews, and I'm crying, and the survivors are crying, or the family members are crying, and they tell you those moments, I grasped onto those for the hope that they were, and to keep going. And, you know, one of the, Dick, Thielen is still around, sassing us all, you know, he's, he's doing great, and, you know, he'll tell you, he'll, he goes and talks to schools to this day, and he'll say, the one thing I tell those kids is you never give up, and if they can fight through that, you can too, whatever comes your way, he says, you fight through it, he says, buck up, and, <laughs> and those are those moments of hope where you know that's how they got through it, that gumption, that passion, that promise they made these young boys. Dick was just 18 by like two or three months when that happened, so, you know, he wasn't going to let his dad down, and similar stories to this, you go through it, and you see who these young men were, and they're still those same men, and they say it to you, and their eyes tell it to you, and it kind of felt like our job to, to, to pass that along to you all as readers. And I just want to add to that and say that, you know, because of Sarah's long-term relationship with the survivors, I came into the equation in 2011 and then in earnest in 2014, and I did a lot of interviewing too. But Sarah had done it for a number of years, and so, so that insight into, you know, getting into the character's head as you say, as a writer, you know, um, that comes from her long relationship with the survivors. We also had the benefit of a book that the survivors themselves wrote, and it was basically a collection of first-person accounts. And, you know, they, some of them wrote a page, and uh, some of them wrote a line. Uh, I survived. <laughs> that's the whole, that's no. their, that's their oh, contribution. Bob, Bob Brunei, Bob Brunei uh, wrote, I joined the Navy to see the world. We were fighting a war, so I didn't see the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole thing. That was his whole entry. But some survivors wrote pages and pages and pages. So we had the benefit of that not only these interviews, but these amazing first-person testimonies of maybe, what, two-thirds of the survivors mm -hmm. wrote these testimonies in this book. So in that way, we're able to really get inside their head and, and to say, here's, here's how that person was able to hold on to hope. Um. Wow, it, it just it, it's really amazing, and, and I think another really powerful kind of example of of, of hope and, and perseverance comes in the second part of the story, which is the story of trying to exonerate Captain McVeigh. Um, and I mean, one of, this is as you know, I think as a as a reader, and you're following along the story of Captain McVeigh, I think you very much are on his side, and you're like, oh my gosh, like this is how can you possibly blame him? You know, I mean, it was. Uh, uh, he was the captain of the ship, certainly, but he was not the only captain of the only ship that was sunk during the war. Um, you know, it, you're somewhat responsible if you're the captain, but if, you know, an enemy kind of pops up unexpected and, and, and shoots you, uh, uh, torpedoes you and, and your, your ship sinks. Um, so I guess the question for the, for the second part of, this, of the story that I have for you is, what do we learn from the story of, of Captain McVeigh and, and why the survivors were for years and years? I mean, they kind of, they just didn't give up. And I guess that's part of the nature of what happened to them, right? But, but why, why, why was it so important to them to go to bat for Captain McVeigh? The people, the men of Indianapolis regarded her as their home. 
and they regarded you know, the crew as a unit. And so to them, uh, to a large degree, them, uh, the, the Navy blaming Captain McVeigh for the sinking was the same as blaming all of them. Because the captain is, of a, I mean, I'm a Navy veteran, and you know, even in the manuals, I was an air traffic controller. In, the, in my air traffic control manuals, it would say, if a plane crashes on the airfield, and let's say I'm the controller, the CO is responsible. But you see, that's only in a putative way. It's only as a figurehead. But they took it to mean that they, the crew, were deficient. And so that was one of the reasons for their um, perseverance in trying to have him exonerated. Another reason was because they believed that he was truly an innocent man, that there was nothing that could be done. And in addition, um, something that we haven't really gone into here and something that you'll um, find out if you read the book is that the Navy had intelligence that there were Japanese submarines coming down into the Philippine Sea operating on offensive maneuvers, but they didn't pass that to Captain McVeigh. They also, knowing that, did not give him an escort, which in uh, the World War II Pacific, there were different kinds of ships, obviously, and cruisers did not have any sound detection equipment. And so they were a bit defenseless against submarines, so the, the policy and procedure was to send them with a destroyer escort or a destroyer. And then the destroyer could protect the cruiser with its sound gear. And even if they were attacked, if the cruiser were sunk, the, destro the destroyer just transformed on the spot into an ambulance and picked up all the crew. So you can imagine we wouldn't even be sitting here tonight if that had happened if Indianapolis had gotten an escort. So all of these circumstances and conditions set the scene for this disaster, and the survivors, to a man, did not think that Captain McVeigh was at fault. And so in 1960, when they had their first reunion in the city of Indianapolis, first of all, as you can imagine, Captain McVeigh was very nervous to see all his crew again, his surviving crew, they, he hadn't seen them in 15 years when they had their first reunion in Indianapolis. And do you know what they did when he landed, he and his wife landed in Indianapolis, and they came down the stairs, and all of the survivors and their wives were lined up on the tarmac, and someone called attention on deck. And it chokes me up. Um, so you can imagine how he felt. And from the time of that first reunion, they decided that they were going to exonerate that captain, uh, their captain, and they didn't give up for decades. And you may go into some of how that happened, but. Um. Yeah, well, uh, that actually leads into, into my next question, which is, uh, you know, as a, as a former educator, as, as I mentioned, one of the compelling parts of this story, and I'll, I'll read another passage here, um, is you learned about this story at the age of 13, and in this story, the age of 13 ends up being very important for another major character in, in, in this story. Um, and so we mentioned Captain Toady, who was the, the captain of the submarine Indianapolis and the last captain of the Indianapolis before it was decommissioned. Uh, and so this part is he's, uh, he's, he's coming back for, from a run, uh, and he's just published this article kind of explaining his thoughts on, on the, the story. Uh, and it starts, uh, uh, for those officers, uh, Toadie's writing clear, clearly placed him in the latter camp, meaning uh, that he was not a team player. He was kind of going against a little bit the, the official version of the story that had been in place for decades, and perhaps also in the camp of a precocious Florida eighth grader named Hunter Scott. Hunter had gotten involved with the survivors while researching the Indianapolis story for a school history fair project. Uh, which is just amazing. As a history teacher, you know, sometimes kids walk into my class are like, history, what's it matter at all? You know, it happened years ago, who cares? This is why history matters. This is why you should pay attention. Are there any history teachers in the room or former <laughs> history teachers? You tell your kids to listen to you. All right. Uh, over the past two years, he had single-handedly brought more attention to Indy's story and the survivor's exoneration battle than anyone before him. Hunter's was a pitch-perfect human interest story. Young boy helps old men in their lifelong quest to correct historic injustice. The whole situation was absolutely made for TV, and that's where Hunter had been on NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw, Good Morning America, Today, and more. The list was long, and the Navy brass wasn't happy about it. Um, <laughs> so I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit, you know, as we get towards the end of that long kind of fight for exoneration, these two kind of main characters, uh, Toadie, the captain, and, and Hunter, uh, appear. 
Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, that's really kind of an unlikely coalition of, of people to finally help bring about justice for the captain. Well, yeah, I mean, Hunter was an incredible young man. And what he did, as you said, was he brought the attention of the world to this story. I mean, the men, the survivors, their wives, they were fighting for this for 40 years by now. And this young kid comes in and he wants to, you know, it started off with, he wanted to learn about the men's story, so he started writing letters to them. And what he was finding is that every one of them said, our captain is innocent. And he said, well, why? Why is he not innocent? And he started getting into it. And you know, with, with his history teacher and with um, his father and a local um, representative, Joe Scarborough, who is now Morning Joe, um, got the attention of media and it kind of took off from there. But meanwhile, the survivors were still walking the halls of Congress. And Bill Toady comes into the picture. And he, you know, in the Navy, has another perspective. You know, he has this long tradition of understanding what's going on behind the scenes with the Navy. And so it was really this joint effort that brought the attention to then Senators, um, well, Bob Smith, and then eventually Senator Warner who, you know, Hunter got their attention as well, but that, you know, it was kind of the opposite at the beginning. Like, what are you listening to a kid for? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they wanted to know, why are we, wait, I'm looking at my agenda and I see that, I think he was 12 or 13 by the time. Well, yeah. by the time of the Senate Armed Services Committee yeah. hearing, he was 14, but, you know, Bob Smith was this maverick senator from New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and he was always undertaking unpopular causes. And here comes this kid who says that Captain McVeigh is innocent, but the Navy has relitigated this three or four times over the decades, and they've always come up with the same conclusion that court, the court martial was just and nothing needs to be changed. And here comes Senator Smith to Senator, <clears throat> excuse me, John Warner, who was kind of a lion of the Senate. And, and says, hey, we need to have hearings. And Warner's like, this is a kid. It's a history project. What are you talking about? <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to activate the entire US Senate because of this kid. And Warner was afraid of being embarrassed. But Bob Smith was not one to give up. And then Bill Toady, Captain Toady, worked behind the scenes. And, and <clears throat> Hunter Scott was this popular, endearing face, you know, this, this little kid sitting in front of all of these senators giving his testimony. So it was, it was, it painted quite a picture. Yeah, it's, it, it's remarkable. I don't think we want to, you should read the, the behind the scenes <laughs> kind of maneuvering of Captain Toady is, is really kind of, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if fun's the right word, but it's really kind of in, interesting Intriguing. to see how he helps bring about that, uh, you know, kind of the major things that are happening. And he puts his career on the line. A absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so the last question I'll ask, I want to make sure we have time for some questions from the audience, but the last question I'll ask is, what lesson, if you were to say, here's a lesson you should take away from, from having read this book? For me, it's tell your kids and grandkids, history is important and do your homework. Uh, but, uh, but you as authors, what, what lesson or lessons would you want folks who read this book to take away? Well, the one that I, I have been schooled in for 17 years of working in this is the never give up. Um, that's so important. But what I've learned is actually from what kids have learned reading this and watching the documentary is they, they said they didn't understand the price of freedom. They said they've heard their parents say that. They said they see this and that idea and that concept, but what does that mean? And the coolest thing I ever heard was a kid say, I understand what the cost of freedom means now because I read this or because I watched this. And I was like, yeah. Okay. Um, and so I hope that that's a takeaway, is a remembrance of what the cost of freedom is and how lucky we are to get to say the things we want to say, as dumb as they may be because of what those who went before us did. And what I took away, this was my first serious narrative nonfiction history project. And, and what I took away is that, you know, what, this, what is in this book is the story of ordinary people thrust into extraordinary circumstances. And we don't know how we would behave if we were thrust into those same circumstances. And a friend of mine who reviewed the book, he didn't tell me he was going to review it, um, but he wrote something that I thought was really interesting. He said, um, you know, when those men in the water, when those men went into the water, none of them knew which of them would sacrifice themselves for their shipmates 
and which would sacri sacrifice their shipmates for themselves. And I thought, wow, you know, and that's where heroes are born. I mean, the, these were ordinary men, and everyone in this room were, were all ordinary people. Um, but, you know, the, the test of character comes when we're thrust into extraordinary circumstances, and I would hope that I would make some of the same choices that the, that the men of Indianapolis made. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I want to make sure we have time for some questions uh, from our audience. So we'll take, we'll take some questions from our audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And we have members of our team who have microphones who, who will come by and we'll call on you in just a second. But I also want to say at the last couple of minutes before we uh, head upstairs to the book signing, uh, there's going to be a trivia contest with some prizes. So if you're uh, into <laughs> trivia, make sure you prepare yourself for that. And I hope you've been listening very closely. Um, so we'll start, we'll start over here. Was the captain... Uh, alive to see some of the process of trying to get himself exonerated. Was he around to see that? He was not around to see most of it. Uh, he, the first reunion took place in 1960, and Captain McVeigh, um, as a result of the burden that he carried from the sinking of the ship and the loss of all those men, he committed suicide in 1968. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that there were some of the Lost at Sea family members, not all of them, but some of them and some very influential, who would write these terrible letters and they would send him these letters year after year after year, all the way from 1945 to 1968, and they would say things like, if it weren't for you, I'd be celebrating Christmas with my son. If it weren't for you, my husband would be alive. And finally... Uh, in 1968, he, he just couldn't uh, bear it anymore, and he took his own life. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my name is William Jump. You'll find Ensign Jump on page 455. Could you address the uh, <clears throat> lack of response when the distress signals went out. I understand there were three uh, units that received the distress signals and no one responded. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what we did come across, we went through, as Lynn mentioned earlier, numerous records. And later, much later after the sinking and the rescue was revealed, men came forward who said that they were at a certain station and an SOS was received. But we went to all of those stations and there was no record of those SOSs being received. Um, these, this isn't a cover up. There weren't things that were fabricated. There were no pages missing in the logs. What we believe is that men who wanted to do something, that wanted to be part of it, including how do I say it, other than fabricated um, things. We have- we Or have misremembered. Misremembered. Um, and they were very junior yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think I might be the first uh, Navy veteran to come in and write this story. So when I was reading some of the accounts of the SOSs, I was thinking, wow, if this really happened, uh, about six or seven different logs would have had to have been falsified, um, and none of them were falsified. And also, you know, in the dozens of people would have had to remain silent for 60 decades, or 60 years, mm -hmm. six, six now seven decades. And in the end, um, because we couldn't find any proof that those SOSs were received, we believe that they got off the ship, but we, re we believe that if any were received, they were only fragmentary and, and not actionable. Yes. We'll go back there. And then. Yes, I don't have a question, but I have some information. I was a friend of one of the men that was on that plane that found this ship when it was blown out of the water. And when they went over it and saw all these people in the water, they at first thought that they were the enemy. And as they went down closer, then they realized, no, they were Americans. And unfortunately, on their plane, they didn't have anything that was going to be of much help. But he said what they did is that everything they had, they threw down into the water for them. 
and they didn't have much fuel left, only enough to get back to base. So they couldn't do, be much help other than signaling in and telling what was the disaster was. And this gentleman's name was Joseph Johnson, mm -hmm. and he went every year to that reunion that they had until he was not capable of being able to go anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, and wonder. you might want to, oh, I have a poster if you want to see it. I don't know if this was one of the survivors that made this, but this poster was framed in his home. And when I saw it, it was so emotional to me. Then that's when he told me this story. And I said, I'd like to have a poster like that. And he said, well, I don't think there are any more available. But he sent to the man who had made these, which his name, his name is on there, and, and did get me one. We would, we would love to see that after, after the um, event here. Um, I, I want it, we want to introduce you to someone. Um, will you stand, Jane? This is Jane Gwynn Goodall, who is the daughter of the pilot of the plane that you're talking about. <laughs> we would love to see, I know Jane would love to see that. And, and Joe Johnson is in the book, by the way. Yes, sure. <laughs> you answered my question about the SOS very nicely, but I had another one. If they were spread over 25 miles, how did they collect each one of them? Or did they lose some right up to the last moment? Um, unfortunately, you know, we believe that this, the condition that the men were in by the time rescue happened, every minute counted. So there's belief that, you know, some didn't make it up to the last minute. But they, many vessels, what, there were seven vessels involved in the rescue efforts and they came from different shores so all the different angles were kind of coming and they had a square pattern where they were searching the areas and that's how the different ships found the different groups of men there were also air patrols that were flying a grid to be able to see you know where these men were and any time you know they were spotters for the ships and also you have to remember this is midnight when the men when the ships first arrived, it's the middle of the night. And so it was incredibly difficult to see men. So they, they had LCVPs, which are whale boats, that would go out and they'd have their battle lanterns to light the area and to spot men. And you know, one of the most incredible parts of this book is the story of the rescue. And we felt very privileged to be able to tell that because it really is kind of the end of the story that the survivors couldn't tell because they were so out of their minds and so close to death. But um, as these men are coming in with the LCVPs and they're having to play God, they're having to say, is this man alive? Is this not a man alive? We have to take who we can. And, you know, every one of them struggled with that saying, did we, did we get everyone we could? They would come across a man who was floating with his eyes open. And in order to try to tell if that man was alive or dead, they would actually put their finger on their eyeball to, to, to try to get a reaction. And, as Sarah said, some of them were heartsick because they were like, you know, I think this guy's dead. What if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. Go, um, here first and then there. I have two questions or one statement and a question. Uh, I've only gotten to the point where the Indianapolis is leaving San Francisco to go to Hawaii. What impressed me in your story was these were not men. They were teenagers, 18 years old running that big ship. In fact, the one that took over the helm was just 18 years old. And I was impressed with that part of the story. The other part was I befriended Harlan. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you got to meet Harlan because I read In Harm's Way where he was a hero. And I'm wondering if you've been, I haven't gotten that far in your story yet. Yes, um, I did interview Harlan. Um, Sadly, Harlan just passed away recently. Uh, but he, yes, he was one of the young ensigns aboard at the time and did interview him. So you'll get to see him coming up in the book. I won't give away anything. <laughs> I have a follow up on that. Did Harlan know that the Indianapolis was found? Because I texted him and emailed him, but I never got a response back from him. Except yes, that he had passed. So I don't know if he heard about the ship being found or not. Yeah, he passed away after, and he was. Yeah, we did call him. 
I, I don't know Navy procedure, but has the captain now been reinstated? And if not, is he able to be posthumously by the president? Well, what happened was uh, this long exoneration battle occurred, and it took 50 years for the Navy to finally sign off on the sense of Congress that Captain McVeigh was not culpable, and those are the words that they used. He was not culpable for the sinking of Indianapolis or for the loss of life that followed. And um, even after Congress passed their resolution stating their sense that this was the case, there was still pushback for quite some time because the Navy did not want, they were like, you're Congress, what do we care what you say? Um, and so, so they weren't going to change Captain McVeigh's record. And uh, then uh, Bill Clinton was elected and he appointed, I'm sorry, it was Bill Clinton's um, secretary, Bill Clinton signed the exoneration language that Congress passed. Then, but his Navy secretary, Richard Danzig, would not enter or allow to, the language to be entered in his record. Then George W. Bush was elected and a new Navy secretary was nominated. His name was Gordon England. And Gordon England went to see Senator Smith, the senator that I was talking about before, and Senator Smith appealed to Gordon England, and Gordon England said, you have my word, it will be done. But the survivors didn't really, I don't wanna say trust, but trust the Navy to have that entered in Captain McVeigh's service record, so they asked Captain Bill to that Captain Bill Toady be allowed to do it. So Captain Toady went and got uh, Captain McVeigh's record at the archives in St. Louis and entered that exoneration language in, and that happened in 2001. Hi, thank you for sharing this with us. How many lifeboats or rafts were released for the men to get into? Because even the Titanic had some boats. Was it so quick that it just wasn't possible? Yeah, the ship sank in 12 minutes. And so that didn't allow much time for those rafts to get off the boat or off the ship. Um, there were 16 rafts that got off the ship, but there's only about 30 men that were on rafts. Out of almost 900. Yeah, so the rest were either on floater nets, which are these large nets that have like cork balls on them to keep them afloat, or they were in life jackets or flotsam. And I, I, wouldn't you agree that at least 60% that was the case, at least about- In life jackets. It, just life jackets or nothing at all, just hanging on to somebody that did have a life jacket. So at least 60% of those almost 900 men had almost nothing at all. And we haven't mentioned it here tonight, but they were in the water for five nights and four days. And, and think about that, you know. Swimming. Swimming, five nights and four days. No yeah. water, no food, the sun beating down. And they would begin to uh, lose their minds from exposure, and then they began to get dehydrated. And so as their sanity slipped away, their um, resistance to drinking the salt water also slipped away. And if any of you in here are in the medical profession, you know that drinking salt water would lead to a tremendously painful death. And so it was the sharks, it was the sun, it was a dehydration, it was salt water poisoning. And eventually some of the men began attacking each other because they would look at a man covered in fuel oil and think he was the enemy. And he would think, oh, this, this is a Japanese person here to kill me. And so they began attacking each other and, and a lot of men died from that. One additional question. Oh, sure. Were you able to get any research from the opposition, you know, from the Japanese? or college or whoever keeps records? Yes, um, we had Commander Hashimoto's book, which he wrote, um, telling about the Japanese perspective with submarine warfare and what he was called to do with the Kayatins, which were the suicide submarines. Um, in addition to that, we have letters from the kamikaze pilots, their last letters before they sent home, diaries. Um, Admiral Yugaki wrote a book about what he faced as a Japanese soldier. I believe he was Navy? He, he, he was, I'm, he was an admiral, so yes, Navy. Yeah, 
And so all of these firsthand accounts we use to tell the Japanese perspective, including even what the emperor was going through in the last 72 hours before Japan surrendered. Thank you for bringing this story to us. And now, uh, of course, the Indianapolis was a battle scene and these sailors were in the water. All these ships and uh, planes were coming to rescue them. What were the security concerns for that area if it was still a battle scene? Maybe submarines or other uh, combatants were still there. What were they doing? When they first were sunk, that was a huge concern of the survivors because Japanese submarines had been known to torpedo a ship and then come back and machine gun the survivors. And so that was one of the things that the survivors, once they hit the water, they were really, really worried about that. On the other hand, some of them knew, even Commander Hashimoto, who sank Indianapolis, believed that Indianapolis, a ship that big, America's one of their capital ships, would not have sent a ship out there all by itself. So they thought, Commander Hashimoto thought, that there were probably one or two destroyers lurking around that he would have to contend with if he stuck around. And then um, as, the, as, the, as the rescue proceeded, there was so much American firepower in the area that they weren't really that worried about whether they were going to be attacked or not. But there was a moment when they did think that, that they had uh, gotten a sounding from an enemy submarine. So everything kind of stopped and everybody stood down to see if there really was a submarine, but there wasn't. And by the way, this part of the Philippine Sea was kind of considered the backwater of the war. So th there wasn't a high concern, but they were vigilant. Well, and at the beginning, well, by the time all of the planes had arrived, there wasn't the concern. But I think like when the Doyle and the Bassett, the two rescue ships that first arrived, arrived on scene and they didn't know whether these were Americans or Japanese yet, they were very afraid. And you, know, you were not allowed to have a cigarette on the main deck and for fear that the enemy would spot you. Well, Captain Clater put a huge 18-inch arc light on the ship and shined it up at the sky to let the men know he was coming. And the crew was scared to death because, you know, we can't have a cigarette and now you're putting a beacon on us. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, they had that to contend with. And then also not knowing who they were, you know, was this a trap being set for them when they first arrived on the scene? What, who were these people in the water they didn't know. So I think the very first responders were nervous. And there's a, a whole part about that in the story with one of the ships. But as, it, like, as you said, as the rescue amassed, it was something, you know, the, the fear diminished as more ships and planes arrived. We'll take one last question. It's actually a comment. Thank you, first of all, for your amazing efforts to bring this to us. I finished the book last night at 1.30 in the morning, and, and <laughs> oh, that's not a good thing to do, but because there was, I had so many questions and comments, but earlier in the day when I was reading, especially about um, just before they, the survivors were, were finally being rescued, I turned to my husband and said, I feel like I've been riding the waves. <laughs> <laughs> Did, was it intentional? I mean, you had an, an amazing way of, of, it would be, down in the depths of, of, of the worst things that were happening with all that they were trying to survive from mentally, physically. But then just about the point where I was reading and going, I don't know if I can keep reading this anymore. It was just too intense. You somehow would bring in humor or, or a story that had hope. And it just, you kept doing that. And I realized <laughs> after, after days of reading, you know, just voraciously, you know, I did nothing else but read practically. I realized I'd been riding the waves the whole wow. time. Wow. <laughs> and I literally cool. felt almost seasick. And I, <laughs> I was in bed looking at the book and thinking, I just feel like I'm going like this. I've been doing it for days. Was that intentional or was it just? Well, one of the things that Sarah and I discussed as a strategy for dealing with that part, because it is so horrific, is that there's only so much horrible that you can read you know, at a time, at a time, at a time. And so it was intentional to try to, you know, sometimes it was with humor, and sometimes it was we flash over to Tinian Island and watch them get ready to launch the atomic bomb, or sometimes we flash over to the Philippines and, and see this, you know, idiot lieutenant who, you know, 
kind of th thinks, well, Indy isn't here, so she must not be coming, you know. Um, but, you know, to, to answer your question, yes, it was on purpose. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent. So before we wrap up, we have a couple of items that we want to give away, correct? Yes. Uh, so I will let you explain how you want to do this, and the audience will, uh, you, you'll have fun, I think, so. Okay. I'll explain. You ask the questions. Okay. <laughs> so we have three audiobooks, and we are going to ask you all questions, and we're going to need some help. Is that going to be you? Who's uh, going to decide? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll look. The first hand up. It's my job. And if I get it wrong, sorry, final call. <laughs> yes. So Don't you, call out the answers. You right. have to be first to raise your hand. So you, ha and you have to raise your hand and have the right answer. That's the important <laughs> Okay. Okay. So I'll ask a question that is from some of the things we've talked about tonight. Okay. Okay. In what year was Captain McVeigh finally exonerated? First hand I saw was right there in the corner. The 1968. Oh, sorry, on, on the corner. But yeah, yes. 1968. 1968? No. 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 <laughs> this, I think it's just. Okay. Oh, wait. Is that the next hand? Yeah. I think it's the gentleman in the second row. Oh, in the second row. Yeah. 2001. 2001. Yes. So we're here. Uh, Kylie, can you hand? There you go. Battle stars. Just to note, yeah. you still have to buy the book. That's, uh, that's the rule. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Okay. Who can name three of the 10 battle stars that Indianapolis earned during the Pacific Campaign? Those are battles that she fought in. Mm -hmm. We didn't cover that. <laughs> okay. We're going to give you a hint. Can you oh, name oh, three islands? Wait. Oh, wait. Hand here. Just kidding. Hold on. Go. Last one. How many Indianapolis? Yeah. Okay, this is a really tricky one. How many U.S. Navy vessels have borne the name USS Indianapolis? Oh, in the very back, back there. Nope. Oh. Not two. I'm sorry. Next hand I saw was this one right here. Gentleman in the middle. You're, you're That's you. Around. You. <laughs> three. Not three. A three, I saw one over here. Four. Four. <laughs> okay, to be fair, that's how this question always goes. <laughs> there was a USS Indianapolis before the heavy cruiser, which is the subject of our book. CA-35 was a heavy cruiser, so that's two. Then uh, SSN-697, which is Bill Toady's submarine, uh, nuclear submarine. And then there's LCS-17, which is the newest USS Indianapolis, and she will sail in 2020. All right. Wow. Well, on behalf of our audience, on behalf of all of us here at the Foundation, we are so incredibly grateful that you are here, that you have done this work, that you have written this book. Please join me in giving one final thank you.